again. Uh, I am here to talk a little bit about ticks in Kentucky. I want to give some safety information for folks that live in the state and the surrounding areas. And I also want to talk about something you may have heard about on social media, this University of Kentucky tick surveillance program. I hope that right now everybody can see three different species of ticks. Uh, if anything goes haywire with the visuals, let me know. I've also got a fan on. It gets to be about 92 degrees in my office on days like today. So let me know if that's interfering with the audio at any point. But uh, I'm going to be going through and talking about some of these different species that you see here today. And we're going to be talking about that surveillance program. Uh, when we talk about ticks, I just wanted to mention that for our department here at the University of Kentucky, this is one of our largest extension topics. Uh, I, I am one of three main extension entomologists here on campus. Uh, we have two faculty members and a staff member that are focused on extension. And I just know that for me in particular, ticks are a huge, huge question. Every year I get tons of press release uh, requests on this. We get a lot of questions that come in through the extension offices and then questions here directly through our email or our Facebook page, Kentucky Bugs. Uh, they're definitely at the top of the list for the arthropods that we get questions about. And a lot of the times the questions are centered around things like, are there more ticks now than there used to be? Uh, are there different kinds of ticks that I used to deal with as a kid? I know for people that I talk to that are over about 50 or 55, they aren't as familiar with some of the different species of ticks like Lone Star and Black-Legged Deer ticks. They were more used to dealing with the American dog tick which you see on the right lower side of that triangle, the tick triangle here in the picture. Uh, other people are very concerned about things like Lyme disease, or they're concerned with Rocky Mountain spotted fever, or even worse, the red meat allergy, all things that I'll try to dive into here today. Uh, we're worried about people that enjoy the great outdoors here in Kentucky. We do have a large ecotourism industry here, and we have a lot of people that work outside. We have a huge timber group, lots of people that work in lawns and landscapes. And some people just like to go hunting and fishing. So all of those folks are being exposed to ticks. It seems like they're on the upswing every year. And so we just know that we get a lot of questions here. In terms of their biology, why people are concerned with them, I'll just start with some basics. Ticks are very good at their job. They're external parasites. They're what we call hematophages, which means that they drink blood and feed on only blood. They never find meat. They never eat pollen. They're never going to nibble on a leaf. They are just like Christopher Lee's Dracula here on the right. They solely survive by digesting blood from their hosts. Both males and females will take blood meals throughout their life. This is a little different than you might see with things like mosquitoes. In the mosquitoes, only the female takes a blood meal but both male and female ticks need blood in order to grow from one life stage to the next. They go from egg to larva to nymph to adult. Uh, in, in order to get from those, in between those stages, they need a blood meal to accomplish that. The females do take some extra blood in their life so they can help to produce the eggs that will make the next generation. So it's all about blood with them. They do have some special traits that I think allow them to be really good at this job. One of them you can see on display in the image on the left. If you've ever heard the phrase, I'm as full as a tick, we say that for a reason. These are fully engorged ticks. They most likely fed on their host for a week to maybe up to 10 days to get to the point that you see here. Ticks are pretty famous for going from about the width of a sunflower seed uh, to the size and dimensions of a grape or blueberry. Their bodies are incredibly elastic and this allows them to take one meal that will help to allow them to go to the next stage of life. So one meal is all they need in order to get enough blood to graduate to the next stage. Uh, I always joke that these big fat ones on the, on the left here, they look like the, the newest flavor of fruit gushers. Uh, they're just big and swollen and that's very helpful for them to only need that one blood meal. The other thing I would point out that's helpful for ticks is that they're actually really good at waiting long periods of time before succumbing to starvation. They can wait out these lean periods where maybe they don't encounter a mouse or a deer or a human to climb aboard and get the blood meal from. They can wait up to a year between meals and still survive, which is quite astonishing. So generally speaking, a tick lives for one year and then they perish. But in some cases, if they've had these starving periods, they can get to be two to even over two years old, uh, just waiting out those lean periods of time. So those two things help them to be quite successful and good at their job. Their mouth is also specially designed to help them accomplish this. What you see in this little video on the left, and I'm hopeful it's moving for you, is the insertion of their mouth part. So ticks have a rigid saw-like mouth part 
It has backward facing spines. At the tip of it, there are these little chelicera is what we call them. They're uh, related to the same things that we call fangs on spiders. They've just been heavily modified to be little snipping scissor-like objects instead. And they cut into your skin. They numb the area with some saliva. Then they insert this hypostome. Uh, the hypostome is the uh, saw-like part that you see on the right with those backward facing spines. As it slides in, they're penetrating your skin and your blood vessels with saliva. The saliva is there to make your blood thinner, so it's easier for them to slurp out. It also helps to cement them in place. And given a, an undisturbed area, if they're not found, they can remain attached to the host for seven to 10 days. Normally this happens with wild animals and occasionally domestic animals like cattle and sheep, uh, but it can happen to people too. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Uh, most people will find a tick when it's feeding on them before that period of time is up, but I have had multiple clients. My most, my favorite one, I used to be an extension agent for the University of Nebraska. And I had a client and she came in and it was a Tuesday. Uh, it was after a long weekend, a three-day weekend. And she had been camping, I think for, she said for about 10 days. And she brought in a tick that was fully engorged. And she said that the night before she'd gotten home uh, from her long camping trip and she had laid down and was reading and she felt something weird on her belly button and she pulled her shirt up and a tick was crawling out of her belly button. It had been hidden in there for probably nine to 10 days feeding on her and she had no clue. So they're very sneaky. They're very good at what they do. And all of these different attributes I've kind of listed out, that's what makes them so successful. The way that they get on us and on our pets and on our animals is a little different than what some people have a conception of in their head. Ticks do generally prefer habitat that is shaded. Uh, they like lots of tangled overgrowth, but they like that tree covered area, that shady area, not because of the trees themselves, but because of the undergrowth, that overgrowth that's happening on the bottom. Uh, the trees, they don't normally get up into. I talk to a lot of folks, they have this concept that ticks are like up in the trees on a, a higher limb and they kind of got some binoculars and they're looking down at you and they're waiting to do a parachute down onto your head so they can feed on you. The truth is, is that ticks are much closer to the ground. They're usually at about knee or hip height for us, which is usually about shoulder height for many animals that are walking through uh, or ear height for some of the smaller ones. And they perform an action we call questing. You can see it in the GIF on the left and then in the still image on the right here. They crawl to the end of a leaf or to the end of a blade of grass or a branch and they just put their front arms out and then they kind of park themselves there and they wait. They're waiting for something to walk by. They'll sense your vibrations. They'll sense your carbon dioxide and your heat and they'll be able to orient themselves and then they'll grab a hold of the fur or of your clothes. And then they climb aboard to look for a sweaty spot where they can insert those mouth parts. So it's a very sneaky way that they go about this, that they get onto our bodies. Uh, they're kind of hiding lower on our lower leg level. Once on board, they're going to move to a spot with thinner skin and plenty of blood vessels. This uh, video on the right that you're seeing as the tick crawls on the skin, I'm guessing that gives many of you the willies like it gives me. I remember one time I went out to a park with some friends and I left and unbeknownst to me, I had two ticks that were crawling through my beard and I can still feel it in my imagination when I, when I think about that day. Uh, I plucked them out and threw them out my window while I was going 65 miles an hour down the highway, but that was very satisfying. But usually they're gonna move slowly and methodically across your skin. Sometimes they trip the hairs on you and you may notice their movement, but generally they're undetected. And they're gonna find that thinner skin, an area that folds. They like knee pits and groins and armpits. Uh, they like to be behind ears. On animals, they love the thinner scalpel skin uh, because it's easier to put their mouth part through there and there's lots of blood vessels. Once they plug in, they're gonna feed for an extended period of time uh, or until they're discovered and removed. At that point, you can hopefully uh, get rid of them and not have to worry about them. Uh, Kentucky has three primary tick species which can impact human and animal health. They are the black-legged tick, also known as the deer tick, then the lone star tick, also known as turkey ticks and turkey mites. That's in the center row uh, in the diagram on the left. And then the American dog tick, also known as the wood tick in the lower row in the diagram on the left. Uh, these three species are not the only ticks that live in the state. 
but they're the ones that most confront us as humans or as pet owners or as cattle ranchers and folks like that. So they're not the only ones, but they are the most important. The one that is familiar to many people is the American dog tick. If we look at them here, they sort of have a sunflower seed shape. They have what is called a scutum on top of them. Uh, all ticks have scutums, but they look different compared uh, to species to species. And with this one, the female has a shortened scutum. I'm motioning with the arrow here on the left. I think it looks kind of like a lace collar that goes around her neck, but it doesn't extend all the way down to the tip of her abdomen. For the male, it does. It goes from his neck to the end of his rear end. Uh, it covers his entire back and helps to protect them. That means that he doesn't swell up quite as much, uh, but he does look distinctive. I think the male looks like he has a Rorschach ink pattern on the back, while the female looks like she has more of this lace collar wrapped around her neck. These are fairly common. Uh, they are found usually in grassy fields, along roads, they like walkways and trails. Again, they quest at uh, host height in order to climb aboard. And as the name implies, they really like dogs. Traditionally, this is the tick that most people I've encountered in Kentucky think of. But it is being supplanted seemingly by this species, the Lone Star Tick. We have a graduate research assistant. Her name is Anna Pasternak. And she is the one that works on ticks in our department. She's been performing surveys across the state for the last three years. And in her survey, this is the most common tick. It is number one by far every year that she does the survey. So Lone Star ticks are becoming more important in the state. They look a little different than the other ticks. Uh, when they're young, they're very round. The larva and nymph are both very uh, hockey puck in shape. And then they get a little bigger and they start to have more of a teardrop shape, but their rear end is still much rounder compared to the other ticks. The female is noted for this white dot on her back. The male does not have that dot. He has four yellow lines on his back, and then you can kind of see the edge of his abdomen. It looks crimped like ravioli almost. I'm going to see how many foods I can ruin for you here today. Uh, they also have longer mouth parts when compared to the other ticks. So a more rounded body, if it has that white dot, and then if the mouth looks really long for their body, that's most likely a lone star tick that you've encountered. They are found frequently in woodland type areas. They like a dense undergrowth, but we also find them on urban and suburban walking trails. We see them in parks and golf courses. Uh, they seem to be pretty prevalent across the state. They are also interesting because while they do quest, you can see that in the image on the right, they also will actively hunt you. Uh, they are sort of like the walking dead. You can see them shamble after you down the trail if you're paying attention. Uh, they will start to walk towards your body heat. They can sense you and they'll try to get on you and climb aboard after that. If you look in the bag on the left there, those are some small dots in that corner of that bag. This is just a smattering of ticks that were brought into the office. All of these are immature Lone Star ticks. Uh, they haven't quite developed. Many people call these seed ticks. They are small and we step into their nest, their area where they may be hatched. And then they can actually climb aboard you and feed. They can crawl through the mesh of your shoes. You can end up with dozens, even hundreds of these things on you at a time. So I like to point out that this is an aggressive tick species. It's growing in population here. And it seems like we can often end up with lots of them feeding on us. I had a good friend once that got a bunch of them while we were working in the field and he removed them with duct tape. I don't know, normally recommend that, but he had so many on his calf, he just wrapped his whole calf in duct tape and ripped it off and he pulled all the ticks out and I think most of his leg hair. So he was really silky smooth down there. Uh, the final tick species that's normal that I wanna mention is the black-legged deer tick. These are greatly feared for their association with Lyme. On the Eastern half of the country, this is the only species of tick that vectors Lyme disease, the pathogen responsible for Lyme disease, I should say. If you go out west, there are others, but here in Kentucky, here on the Eastern seaboard, this is the only species. The female is the most famous version. As an adult, she has this sort of orange reddish color. They do have black legs compared to the other ticks. The male is very nondescript looking. He is sort of chocolate colored and then has this creamy horseshoe that goes around the edge of his body. Uh, but really it's the female that kind of steals the show here. They are found most commonly in areas where their preferred host, the white-tailed deer are found. That's what they want to feed on. 
they are active any day above freezing. So I always like to point out that while the a dog tick and the lone star tick, the adults are commonly found from May until August, people think that that's the end of tick season, but black-legged deer ticks as adults, they can be active in December, January, February, and March on any day above freezing. You'll find them out and about looking for deer and looking for hunters, frankly, uh, if they can get on them. They're usually found about knee high on the tips of branches and on low growing shrubs. And then once they feed on you, there is the possibility they could vector something like Lyme disease to you. In the past, Kentucky was not considered a strong black-legged deer tick state. It was also not considered a strong Lyme state according to historical information, but that has absolutely changed. Uh, it's fair to say that Lyme is infiltrating the state. I'll have a, a chart that shows that. While compared to somewhere like Connecticut, we may have fewer cases, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about Lyme in the state of Kentucky. Everybody should be very conscientious of it and take steps to protect themselves from it. And part of the reason that we think this is happening is that there's a northern variant of the black-legged deer tick, which we think is infiltrating the state. Usually when we talk about climate change, we talk about southern things moving north. For some reason, in this instance, a northern variant of the species is moving in. They are problematic because they feed on deer more often. They are more often above leaf litter. The southern variant of the deer tick is often in the leaf litter feeding on lizards, while the northern one wants to be up in the air. And so that could mean that we get exposed to it more and then have more Lyme vectored here in the state. I also want to mention that there is an invasive tick species that's here. It's called the Asian longhorn tick. It was accidentally introduced sometime before 2015. It's native to East Asia. It was, it's been intercepted multiple times in the United States. There are some indications it got here as early as 2010, uh, but it was confirmed in the United States in New Jersey in 2017. Since then, it has spread to multiple other states. There have been five Kentucky reports. You can see the counties highlighted in red on the right are areas where ALT was found as of last fall. Asian longhorn tick has been found in Boone, Floyd, Madison, Martin, and Metcalf counties. The Boone and Metcalf County finds involved livestock. They were on uh, cattle. Uh, the other ones, the Madison County one was on a human, it was actually a construction worker from Tennessee that was in the county working on a site. And then the Martin and Floyd finds involved wildlife. One was a bear uh, and the other was an elk. So with those finds, they involve various animals. They may wander across geopolitical boundaries. You can see that Virginia and West Virginia on the left have multiple counties that have been listed as found or infested. And so we are afraid of those animals bringing them in. If there's cattle that's bought and sold and brought across the river or brought into the state, those could be other ways that it gets introduced. It's something that's going to have an impact on our wildlife and on our cattle producers. In regards to the diseases that are associated with ticks, we are worried, of course, about various things, but there's things like Kentucky Lyme disease cases, which have gone up 57% between 2012 and 2018. These are counties where we have had reports of Lyme that have come from doctor's offices and been matriculated upwards. You can see the darker the county is, uh, the more reports have come from that county. We do see that a lot of counties that have high Lyme reports seem to be on the perimeter of our state, but we do have a line that seems to be infiltrating in. So this is something that's on the rise. If a doctor argues with you about this, this is something that we're trying to provide education on. We're trying to educate the medical community that Lyme is on the rise in the state. I don't wanna make it sound like an epidemic. These numbers in these counties may only be five to 10 people, but that's higher than it used to be. And so we do need to start reporting this more. If the county is white in color, that doesn't mean that Lyme's not there. It just means that we haven't had any reports get to the CDC. So we have to start taking this more seriously. Rocky Mountain spotted fever has gone up 290% in the state between 2012 and 2018. Again, the darker the county color, the more there have been reports of that disease from those counties. Rocky Mountain spotted fever can be very painful. It has in the past had a 30% mortality rate without intervention. Uh, there can be complications from it if uh, it's not dealt with. The same can be said for ehrlichiosis. It's had a 158% increase between 2012 and 2018. 
Another map here showing incidences seems to be higher out west. Uh, the, uh, the problem with all of these ticks and all of these diseases is that we really wanna know where they are and what problems are present in our state. And so there's a research group here on campus at UK that initiated a tick surveillance project. This actually started back in 2019 and it was focused on collaborating with Kentucky veterinarian offices and medical facilities in order to receive ticks from the public that maybe came in with clients that visited those areas. So they could be on a dog or they could be on a human, but once the tick was collected, it could be cataloged and then shipped to campus here and we could test it for pathogens and then start to build a map that showed where ticks are, uh, what species of tick, and then what pathogens people may be exposed to in various counties. Uh, after doing that for about three years, it was decided that maybe we could expand this. Uh, I would like to point out, I am not a part of this research group. I am a 100% extension professional. So I do a lot of talking about bugs, but the researchers on campus, they wanted more ticks. And so in an attempt to receive more ticks from the general public, there was a press release that was put together to discuss the project. And it came out in April, late April, and it was about a few different people that are doing research here on campus, but part of it featured an interview with Dr. Reddy Polly, our chair, and then Anna Pasternak, who are the tick survey people. Uh, there was a lot of interest in that from the media. And so the Kentucky, uh, Kentucky.com folks, the Lexington Herald leader, they did a follow-up interview with those folks about the survey to get more information. And they generated the article that you see on the right on April 20th, found a tick, mail it to this UK professor to see if it carries disease. They kind of merged it with a couple of other news stories they had done, one was with me. And so there was a video of me at the top of the page before I cut my hair uh, after the quarantine and everything. And they talked in this article about how if the tick is submitted and it tests positive for a pathogen, an alert could be generated to the person so that they would know what they were possibly exposed to. Uh, from that, there was a lot of interest. Uh, dozens of newspapers across the state began to report on this project. I received several links from agents. Uh, here's the News Enterprise. Uh, this is KentuckyHealthNews.com through the UK uh, Health Department. And along the way, it was sort of added in that you could take your ticks to your local extension office and they would mail it for you to the University of Kentucky. This was the start of some misinformation. Uh, unfortunately, the story was sort of changing and morphing, and there was an extreme focus on the fact that you could hear from this group that your tick tested positive after they ran it through their DNA testing. While that's true, it wasn't the focal point of the project. Uh, this wasn't something that was being conceived of as a medical service, something that we could offer for free to test a tick. It's not done in a very timely fashion, and it's really all about the surveillance project. You should be able to see this on a map. You should get an email that lets you know what was found, but it's not something that you would hear about in 24 hours so you could go to the doctor. It may be a month to two months before we find uh, the tick in the project and then test it. So there's a lot of focus on that part. And unfortunately, that is what started to move to social media outlets like Facebook. Uh, private individuals began to read about the project through the news. They generated a Facebook a post, which they shared with their friends. These were just individual people that live in Kentucky. They made a little blurb and they would put a picture of a tick or they would list out an address where they, they had heard that they should send the ticks. And these started to get shared quite a bit. These posts were then adapted. Uh, eventually, some of them started to get up to about five to 7,000 shares on Facebook, mostly of Kentuckians. But then there were people that started to adapt their posts and make their own. And these were groups, usually. Uh, some of them were, in fact, I guess, Facebook celebrities, you could say, influencers on there. Uh, these are the ones that started to get a lot of attention. One post that you see on the left has been shared 25,000-ish times. That was from a farm in the state of Kentucky. I don't want to mention their name because they've actually gotten a lot of grief for this. And then there is an internet personality named Dr. Monica. She made one, and it's been shared about 31,000 times. Uh, based on those numbers, this means that these advertisements about this have been seen by around a million people most likely. These contain almost entirely incorrect information. It is true that we're accepting ticks, 
but none of these provided the, the information that this was only for Kentucky residents, uh, the proper way to mail the ticks in, everything about them basically was wrong. And we started to get a lot of things shipped to the department that were improperly packaged, that were soaked with alcohol and things like that. Uh, at worst, it was those poor instructions, or at best, that was uh, 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 what happened. At best, it was just poor instructions. At worst, they actually doxed the graduate student that I mentioned before. Uh, they publicly released her private information, so she was getting lots of angry phone calls uh, throughout the night even, and had to change her cell phone number and things like that. Uh, it's just become kind of a, a mess, if I was being honest. So, Unfortunately, at that point, the tick was out of the bag, uh, philosophical or uh, sort of speaking in a metaphor. Uh, literally, though, in some cases, we were getting boxes and things that were full of live ticks that we would open and they would start to crawl out. We receive every day about 150 to 200 ticks. You can see we have our own boxes now from the U.S. Postal Service uh, that had to lend them to us just to be able to bring these in. Many of these will be rejected because they are from other states. We've gotten them from as far away as Alaska. Uh, we get a lot from Ohio and Indiana and Tennessee. And there's been attempts to correct the misinformation. We've made Facebook posts on Kentucky bugs about this. There were a couple of different news stories trying to clarify what we were looking for, but it hasn't really slowed the misinformation down, unfortunately. So we get a lot of samples that are soaked with alcohol, uh, they have live ticks in them. They have fully engorged ticks in them that have been popped by the mail machines. So the envelope is full of blood and tick bits. It's really been uh, kind of a, a travesty, if I was going to be speaking honestly. I know I'm being recorded, so I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Uh, and a lot of those aren't going to be tested. They'll be out and out rejected because they don't fit the parameters of the study. If you do want to participate in the project, we have very strict protocols that must be adhered to. First, the tick that is submitted has to be from Kentucky, and it has to, be of, has to have been collected relatively recently, within the last few weeks. Uh, we've had multiple people say that they've had ticks they've kept on hand for, one was five years old. Uh, we've had others that were one to two years old that have been frozen. We, we don't want to accept those ticks. Those are not going to be useful for the project. So it should be a tick that you encountered recently, and it needs to be dead when submitted. So you need to kill it first. Uh, and to do that, we also have a way that you can preserve it so that when it gets to us, it can still be tested. So what will happen is you find the tick on you, you put it in a, a plastic container, perhaps an empty pill bottle or a small Ziploc uh, bag or even uh, a travel makeup container or a piece of Tupperware. And then you submerge the tick in 91% isopropyl alcohol, which can be found for about a buck at most pharmacies. You'll leave the tick in there till it dies and then wait 24 hours. You will then take the tick out, pour the alcohol away if it's in a bag. Uh, you don't want liquid alcohol in the envelope that you're going to ship. You can get in trouble with the post office for that. Uh, they can fine you up to $10,000 for endangering people with a flammable liquid. So you'll take the tick and put it, in our recommendations, in a Ziploc bag that seals with a cotton ball that will soak up any excess alcohol. Then you take that bag and insert it in a second Ziploc bag and then seal that one. Next, you take that and put that in a uh, sealable uh, envelope, a padded envelope. The optimal way to do this would be to have the tick in a hard container as well. In fact, uh, I misspoke slightly. They want, you have to have it in a hard container. So you put the tick in the pill bottle or whatever, then put that in a bag and put that, other, that bag in another bag. Uh, then put that in a padded envelope and ship it. There is an, an address in this tick surveillance webpage that you see here. I can put that in the chat here in a moment uh, when we finish. But if you follow those steps, the tick will be accepted. It also has to include this form, which is also found on our website, that gives a lot of detailed information about who you are, what your address is, where we can contact you, when you discovered the tick, when you collected it, when it was shipped, where do you think you got it from? all these important questions that they need to have in order for the project to work. So you have to fill that out. Without that form, your tick will also be rejected. This is a surveillance project. Without that data, they can't make surveillance. They can't know where the tick came from. So it's very important that all of these parameters are fulfilled. 
with that, I want to end by telling you that, you know, it is the tick season right now. I hope that when you go outside, you're doing tick checks when you come in. Uh, check in and around your ears, your hair, inside your belly button, under your arms, around your waist, and behind your knees. Highly encourage you to maybe even get in the shower because you could wash them off. Uh, it's also easier in there to maybe move and bend around or sit on a, a seat in order to check the different spots of your body that may be hard to look at. And make sure you look for those ticks before they feed on you for an extended period of time. Wear repellents, wear permethrin treated clothing. All of the repellents that you see here are effective against ticks as well as mosquitoes. The oil of lemon eucalyptus, IR3535, picaridin, and DEET are all skin based repellents which can be applied to your body that repel those biting pests. Permethrin, which you see listed as Coleman gear and clothing aerosol, that's only for clothing. You would treat your clothes uh, directly with it. Once they're dry, you wear them. And then when ticks crawl on there, it will kill them. That uh, can be very satisfying at the end of a long camping trip or a day clearing brush. You shake out your treated pants and a bunch of dead ticks fall to the ground and you know that you were protected. But do not apply it to the skin. It is only for clothing. You can buy clothes that are impregnated with it when you purchase them. They last a little longer uh, in terms of washes. The permethrin we spray on will wash off after a 10 or a dozen. Those impregnated clothes can last 30 or 40 wash cycles though. If you do find a tick embedded with you, remove it as soon as possible with pointy tweezers. Don't use those tick twisters or anything that you see sold like that that encourage you to twist the tick out. You just wanna grip it on its head as close to your skin as possible and pull straight up. You'll be steady when you pull up. You don't wanna yank it, grip it and rip it. You want to pull steadily up. It will hurt. It will not be easy, but it eventually will come out. Don't wiggle it. Don't twist it around. You can break bits of the tick off in you, and that's very unhealthy for you. Also, while it's plugged into you, don't burn it with a match. Don't pour alcohol or essential oils on it. It's true that many of these things will cause the tick to back out of you, but it also encourages them to vomit, and that can increase the likelihood of disease transmission. If you want to burn it, or submerge it in alcohol after you get it out of your skin, that's your business. You can kill it and curse it to Hades for all I care, but you should do it once it's out of your skin. You should also keep it on hand in a Ziploc bag in your freezer and monitor yourself for headaches, confusion, fever, or any strange rashes on your body. And then you need to take that tick with, when you, with you when you go to the doctor. And so they'll be able to identify it and know what you may be infected with. This is my contact info. If I can offer any information, I apologize if I went over a little bit on time. Are there any questions I can help with here today?